Hello and welcome to Griffin Art and today I'm going to be covering the third and final phase in this jack-in-the-box style gift box tutorial. Now you may recall that a little while ago I created a tutorial that showed you how to make this hexagonal bellows fold and you do require three of those bellows sections for this particular project. Now additionally, last week I created a tutorial which showed you how to make this hexagonal uh, gift box which has been specifically designed to take that jack component. So you will additionally need one of these boxes. Now, if you haven't already encountered the video tutorials for these two components, I will be including a link in the description area for this video to a jack-in-the-box playlist which will contain all three video tutorials relating to this complete project, so you will have easy access to those. So before we go any further, let's just have a look and see what it is that we're covering in the tutorial today. So we've already got our bellows sections, we've seen those already today, but I will be showing you how to join multiple bellows components together to form a longer bellows. I'll be showing you how to make and fit this little internal hexagonal compartment which will take a gift how to aesthetically finish off the top of the bellows or jack section and then how to fit that jack inside the hexagonal containing box. Now the first thing that I like to do is to join my bellows sections together so that I can set them aside under a weight and allow that glue to dry whilst I get on with other things. Before I get on with my gluing though, I do just want to make you aware of one thing. Now, where the bellows are joined together at that side seam, there is additional bolt because you've got more than one layer of card there. Now if I press these together, you can see hopefully here that that creates a bulk and that potentially means that you're going to end up with a lopsided bellows and it's just something you want to be aware of. Now I actually want to try and compensate for that when I'm joining my bellows components together. So when I join them I know that there's a seam on this one here so if I put that so that that point is there, the seam on this one is in this position here. So I'm, when I glue together, all I need to do is make sure that I don't overlap those two seam areas. And that will help compensate for that lopsidedness. So that's just something to be aware of. Now I'm just going to use my normal combination of double-sided tape and glue and I'm just using these triangular sections as an adhesive platform. So I'll just get on and apply the glue to these sections here. I want a good coating because, uh, you know, I, it, it, this, this bellows is going up and down. I like to wear on the side of caution, so I want the whole thing coated, really. And hopefully when I put the sections under a weight, all of this area will come into contact and uh, form a good bond. So I'll just remove that backing tape from my double-sided tape. and then double checking where those seams are, making sure that they're not going to overlap. Decide where I want to put it, probably on the other opposite side. So I'm just joining these triangular sections together now and lining up the edges as much as I can and using that uh, double-sided tape for that instant adhesion.
So if I then compress the bellows, and I won't join the next section to this until I know this first section is dry. So what I'll do is I'll put that under a weight now and we'll get on with other parts of the project and off camera I will join the remaining section in exactly the same way just making sure that um, the seam line is in another area. Right, so whilst our bellows are drying under compression, we can get on and make our little internal gift box. Now, before we get started, I do just want to make those of you who are not used to my tutorials aware that you don't really need to worry about taking any notes. At the end of this video, there will be a series of still shots that will provide you with card sizes that we're using, scoring information, some basic constructional information and a diagram to refresh your memory. And in this case, there's also a free downloadable PDF which gives you all the hexagon sizes that we use in this tutorial just to make this project a little easier for you. Right, so for my little internal box, I've just got a piece of card in landscape mode that's actually six and three eighths of an inch by three and a half inches. And I'm going to be scoring on the wrong side of my card at one inch intervals. I'll just quickly do that. So you've probably gathered that's the six sides to our box plus a little tab for joining. So I'm now going to turn my card anti-clockwise. It doesn't really matter. It's symmetrical actually. So it doesn't matter which way you turn it. And I'm going to score at three quarters of an inch and at two and three quarters of an inch. So that's going to end up creating three quarters of an inch flaps, top and bottom. And we've now finished with our scoring board, so that means we can fold and crease all of our, those score lines. So I'm just going to very quickly get on and do that. Now, if again, if you're new to box making, probably should just point out that when you're folding and creasing, the main thing is to line up your score line patterns. So the fold line on this side of the card needs to be in a good straight line with the scoring lines that you can see. So don't worry too much about the edges of your card. If they're not square, it doesn't matter. It's more important to use the grid that you formed and you know is square. And that should ensure that you end up with a nice square box. Those of you who've watched my tutorials would have heard me say that a number of times before. Quickly get on with that. So with that done, we just need to create a little flap that we can use to join the sides of our box together. And that means just removing these little bits of card in the corner. So it's this one here and this one. And when you do that, if you remove all evidence of the fold line at the same time, uh, you go, your box is going to go together more easily. So just that one. Now the next thing that we need to do is to create some flaps for the top and bottom of our box. And all that entails is for each of these little score lines, top and bottom, we're just going to cover, cut down the center of that fold line. So if I do one or two, so it's just creating those flaps, so it's up to that, and it's exactly the same on the other side as well. So just up to that intersecting score line and fold line. All right? So I'm, I'll do the rest off camera to save time and I'll come back to you at that point. Right, so that's all those flaps created. And you can also see that I've 
started to apply some double-sided tape for adhesion. Now, these flaps are actually the same size, three quarters of an inch, top and bottom. So at the, before you start applying your adhesion, there is no top and bottom to your box. Either will serve that purpose. Now, I have started to place double-sided tape. There's a, some tape on the side there, and that's going to allow me to join the sides of my box together. I've also made a decision as to which the top and the bottom of the box is. So on the decorative side of my box, which is the same side as I've applied double-sided tape here, so this is the right side of my card, I've applied double-sided tape to the little flaps and that means these are going to be stuck down this way and that means also that that's going to be the top of my box. Now, on the inside of my card, just flip that over, on the bottom section, I've also applied double-sided tape and that means that's going to form the bottom of my box because they're going to fold in that way. So I hope that helps you to identify where you need to be applying your adhesion. So we may as well now just get on and um, apply some PVA to this side flap and join the side of our box together. Now it doesn't really matter this section here if we get a bit of glue on there because it's never going to be visible. It's actually going to be permanently inside the middle of our bellows section. So in this case, I'm not using my customary overlapping technique. So now it's just a question of lining up your fold lines. And I tend to put the blunt edge of the card, I'll show you in a second, against the edge of this fold or crease line. And then once you're happy with where that's positioned, you can use your bone folder on the inside and just apply the pressure to make sure that that join has got a good bond. So we can now look at our base and that does require a one inch hexagonal shape. Now I have got these Spellbinders Nestabilities Hexagons die cutters and where I have a die cutter of the correct size for this project I am using these for convenience. So I will put the details relating to these in the description area for this video in case you either want to source them or you want to double check that they're the same as something that you already have in your own stock. Now where I haven't got the appropriate sized hexagon in a die cutter, I've simply created out of scrap card a hexagon template that I can then draw around so I can very quickly obtain a cardboard hexagon shape in the size that the project requires. Now although I am using a combination of templates and die cutters, all of the hexagon sizes that you require for this Jack in the Box project are included in that PDF template uh, document that I mentioned earlier and I will put a link to that in the description area for this video so that you have got easy access to that and as long as you print that off at 100% the hexagons will be of the size that you need. Now I should just mention that I did initially forget that this little one inch hexagon was also required for this latter end of the project and that wasn't initially included in the document. So if you've already printed that document off and you're missing the one inch hexagon, it is now included in that document so it might just be worth you downloading it a second time. So let's get on with our base then. Right, so we know that we scored these lines at one inch intervals, so the sides of our box are one inches wide. And we know that this hexagon has got one inch sides, so it's a good fit for our box. We've also identified that where this adhesion is on the wrong side of our box or the inside of our box, that's our box base. And 
we need to stick the wrong side of our hexagon to the wrong side of one of these flaps just to get started. So that's what we'll do. So I'll just pick any sort of flap and apply some PVA glue in the normal way. And just do these one at a time. So I won't do them all on camera. And then it's just a question. So wrong side of the card here going against the wrong side of the flap. And all you're going to do is line up that edge with the fold line of that hexagon. So, sorry, the fold line of where that internal flap is. Because that hexagon needs to sit neatly inside our box. So that's all we're doing, just placing it on that fold line. Might be crooked there. And then that can be turned inside the box and you can apply some pressure from the inside just to help with that adhesion. And you're just going to work your way around those flaps. Now I tend to work with opposites and you can tell that at the moment there is perhaps a slight chance that hexagon is going to drop inside the box. If you're struggling with that, it, you might find that just by placing a ruler underneath, it will give you a little bit of support until you've got the first two flaps down. So let's try that method. So more glue. And certainly this does help if you've got a larger hexagonal box. That ruler is kind of an essential tool at this stage. So I'll just pop that ruler down under there. That gives you something to apply pressure to. Just line everything up. Check that these are all lining up on these other sides as well so that you're getting a proper fit. Just push the, the edge of the hexagon shape against the fold line. Don't worry if these don't line up, it doesn't matter. And then you can apply that pressure on the inside. So I'm just going to work my way around until all those flaps are down and my base is finished at, at, to that point and then I'll come back to you at that stage. So that's all of those flaps stuck down to complete that base section. And that's essentially now that little internal box finish. Now having said that, there is just one last thing that I am going to do, but it is entirely optional. I am now going to take a second hexagon that's a one inch shape and I'm going to attach that to the very base of my box. And I'm doing that simply to provide some additional strength. This is not going to be seen. This box will end up being totally enclosed in that bellows section, which will be stuck to the bottom of the containing box. So you are never going to see this. So you're not looking for aesthetics. It's just for strength. And the considerations here maybe are related to the thickness of your card and the weight of the gift that you want to put inside. So I'll, I'm going to do this off camera just Stick that down, as you can see it positioned there, and I leave it to you as to whether you include this part in your own project. Right, so now that our little box is complete and ready to go, we can set that to one side for the time being, because we need to turn our attention to this framework that it's enclosed in it, and that's where more hexagons start to come into the process. Now to start with, we need three hexagons with two and one eighths of an inch sides. Now I've actually used one of my die cutters for this, but this size hexagon is available in that PDF document that I mentioned earlier. Now with two of those hexagon shapes, so these are the, all the same size, you need to create a hexagonal aperture centrally positioned in the middle of them so that um, the 
hexagon is positioned it's not what you need to be aware of is that it's not creating an equal frame around the inside the larger hexagon you need to twist that smaller hexagon in such a way that the extreme points of the small hexagon are at midpoint to one of the sides on the larger hexagon so that you're creating these sort of triangular sections around that aperture. If you don't do that, then your box will not fit inside that bellows section that you created earlier. Now, as you may have gathered, I've actually used my die cutter to create this internal aperture. And it is quite important if you're die cutting to make sure that this hole is positioned in exactly the same position on both of your card shapes. And the problem with die cutting is that you don't tend to create both shapes at the same time. So if like me, you're using a die cutter, I just want to give you a, a tip in case it's of a help to you. So if we've die cut one and we're ready to pass the other shape through the die cutter, this is what I've found helps. If you position, let's just move that to one side. If you position your die cut shape with your die cut cutter in place and then line that up with your previously cut hexagon so that it's everything's all the sides are nicely lining up if you then pass that through your die cutter the hole in the shape below will be in exactly the same place as the one you cut previously so that's just a little bit of additional information that may help you. So these are our two hexagonal shapes that are finished and ready to be used. But we have this last one that requires a one inch section, hexagonal section to be marked uh, centrally. And this is the best way that I've found to do this. So I'm going to flip my hexagon over so that I've got the wrong side of my card facing upwards. I'm then going to also flip this second hexagonal shape over so that this is also the wrong side of my card facing up because this is how they will go together. I can now see where that aperture is pl placed, which means that I can position my little one inch hexagon shape into that center and I can gauge very easily because it's only a one inch, inch uh, sort of margin all the way around it. I can just with my eye gauge where that needs to be positioned. And once I've done that, I can remove this other shape and set it to one side and just draw around that one inch template whilst it's in position, being very careful not to move it. So that's finished with that template and you should be able to see that shape in the middle there. Now the next thing I'm going to do is draw across those points and the reason for that will become apparent in a moment. So I'm just right those right across those extreme points. It doesn't have to be exact. You don't need to worry or fret about this. It's it's you'll see later what we're using those for. So if I just show you how that's looking, if you can see. Now the only other thing I'm going to do is mark each of those points with a pointed bone folder, or if you haven't got one of these, a knitting needle. Something like that will suffice. It just helps me when I come to score that outside shape. So I'm just going to go around and just put a little indentation on that pencil mark at each of those points so that I can score that hexagonal shape on this side of the card. So I've just put points 
little indentations on each of those corners and I'm now I'm, I'm going to do it off camera because I really need to get down so that I can see these lines and I'll show you the finished item but I'm just going to then score this outline with my bone folder so I'll do that and come back to you when that's ready right I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to see this on camera but there is now an an indented score line all the way around the outside of that hexagon shape so it's been scored the outline has been scored with this uh, pointed bone folder so the next thing that I'm going to do which will start to make things clear for you that central position where all those lines cross in the middle of that hexagon I'm now just going to punch a hole in there easy said than done but it's, I'm just using a little picky pokey tool, a compass point, something like that would do the same job or a long reach punch if you're lucky enough to have one. Um, and that's really just so that I can get my scissors in there and I'm going to cut those lines that I drew earlier just into those corner points where I've scored. So to the outs outside edge of this little hexagon here. I will do them on camera because I think it's something that I need to be totally clear about. So I'm just working my, my way around that shape, cutting those sort of triangular flaps in effect into the corners of that internal hexagon. And again, it doesn't have to be exact, but... Um, these are just creating little flaps. That's all we're doing here, creating some little flaps. Okay, so now if I bend these, this, this is the wrong side of my card, so I'm, I can bend these in this way now. And it, that should form a nice sort of fold line because of where I scored. So that, I obviously haven't cut that one quite far enough, actually. There we go, that's better. So... You can see how easily those little flaps have formed. Now, before I finish there, I am just going to trim off a little triangular section by eye just to neaten it off because these flaps are going to be visible on the inside of our internal box. So just trimming those off and you can use this point to line up the next cutting point as well. Although they're not going to sit side by side, so they're slightly out again. It really doesn't matter. And that means that our three hexagonal components are now all ready to work with. So for the time being, we're going to get rid of two of these shapes. We're just concerned with one of these hexagon shapes that's got that aperture. We're going to take our little box and place that inside that shape. And you can see that it's smaller than that aperture, but that doesn't matter because we're going to cover that up. So all that we're going to do is glue these flaps to the top of this shape. So let's make a start on that. And I know that the glue doesn't need to go all the way to the fold edge because, you know, it's, um, it's not... The, the flaps will go into a space area. So I'm just going to sort of go halfway with my glue. So we'll start with one. Just place that in there and just double check that it's centrally placed along that line. So you've sort of got the same gap either end you know you're about a one eighth of an inch distance so if you turn that upside down you can then gauge how close your positioning is on that and when you're happy that you've got about a one eighth of an inch even gap along that edge you can glue that down and apply customary pressure with your bone folder there we go. So that process just needs to be repeating, repeated rather, um, on all of these flaps so that you get a nice 
even distance around your little internal box. So I'll do that off camera to save time and then I'll come back to you once that process is complete. So that's all of my flaps now glued down in place and the next thing that I want to do is to apply this section over the top. So I've already applied some glue to the back of that with some double sided tape. So I'll just remove the backing from the double sided tape. And you may have noticed that I haven't put any glue on these flaps at this point in time. We're going to deal with that separately. So we're just going to line everything up in the normal way making sure that these edges are nicely lined up and then just let that glue go off before tackling these center sections. Now you do want to apply pressure around these edges because you, you want them to be as a single component really so just keep working the edges as that glue goes off to make sure that you're getting a good join along this seam line. That bit will be visible when the jack pops up, so it's just worth um, paying a little bit of attention to the detail of that. And that seems to be okay. I'm never very good at deciding things are going on. So I could be here all day. So let's call that finished and we can see where we go from there. Right, so once you're happy that that glue has dried off and made a bond, you can start dealing with these little flaps. The reason why you would leave them is because as soon as you start applying pressure here, it's trying to pull this card away from these edges. So I have found that it's worth just being a little patient, giving this time to, to um, bind to each other and then you can get on and, and deal with these little tiny flaps. So all I'm going to do is my usual thing, apply a little bit of glue. I'll do one so that you can see exactly what's going on and you don't have to guess. And then I'll do the rest off camera because they are all the same and you know, I don't want to waste your time. So there we go. So it's just a little bit of glue, remove the backing, from that double sided tape and then just keeping the other ones out of the way just sticking that down onto the edge of the inside of the box and I tend to quite like to just use my bone folder to work around that edge as well so that you get this nice sort of not only a, a nice soft edge but you also know that it's, it's gluing nicely along that edge as well so that's all you're doing to all of these six flaps. So I'll do that off camera and I can come back to you at that point. Right, so that's all our little tabs. I hope you can see them glued down on the inside there. And if your card is quite a thick card, you may decide that actually you're going to leave the final hexagonal component of your project. It could be that you know you prefer this sort of clean look over and above this alternative look that I'm now going to create. Um, it really is up to you. As long as this section is strong enough, you don't need this final hexagon shape that I'm now about to apply. So in the interest of time, I have taken that final shape and I've already applied my double-sided tape and off camera, I'll put my uh, PVA glue on there as well. And I will just position that as a top layer to that existing collar. And once that's tucked down and had a chance to dry off, I'll come back to you because that's at that point, it's all three components ready to go. Right, so that's the final hexagon applied to my little gift box collar. 
and even though the the glue the PVA has yet to cure and that will obviously strengthen it as it does even so already that's quite a strong collar which is going to enable me to control the springiness of my bellows and push it back into its containing box now speaking of which our three bellows components are now nicely dried off they've been stuck together and you can see that they're giving us quite a nice sized bellows component certainly significantly taller than our box now before we go ahead and join these two components together I do just want to uh, show you how different thicknesses of card can produce different heights of bellows and you may well want to give some thought to this. So the first thing that you need to consider in terms of the number of bellows components you use is the height of your little gift box or at the, at the very most the height of your containing box because when the bellows are compressed they need to be able to fit inside the box. So if we just slot this in place ready and I squash that down into position you can actually see that even when it's fully compressed there's quite a lot of box left so you could probably get away with even another set of bellows components so four rather than three if you want your jack to spring that much higher. Now if I show you this um, prototype box, so this is the original jack-in-the-box that, that helped me form this tutorial, this bellows, you can see, if I set the box side by side, is considerably lower than this bellows, even though it comprises three bellows components in the same way. It's simply that this card is much thinner than the card I've used today, and therefore the height of the bellows varies. Now, I could have have added more components to this particular project and that would have meant that the bellows height would equal this one because it, it, it they just compress more so if I perhaps put five uh, bellows components together it might have reached the same height so that's just a couple of things for you to be aware of you know and assess how high do you want your bellows to be Right, so with that point made, we can stick this component to this one. And I, I will do this off camera because it's exactly the same principle that we used at the beginning of this tutorial when we stuck the um, separate bellows components together. So you can already see that I've applied the double-sided tape in the usual way. I'm just going to put glue, PVA glue, onto these triangular sections, then I will no glue applied there at all. I'll just place my um, internal gift box into that uh, central section and apply some pressure until that collar sticks to the top of the bellows in exactly the same way as one bellows component would stick to another. So I'm sh I hope that's clear enough for you. I'm going to just pop away and do that off camera and then I'll come back to you when that's ready to go. Right, so that's the collar. I'm, I'm satisfied that that's, that glue has gone off enough to, to move on to the next uh, process. And, and you can see that's nicely joined on our bellows now and you know the bottom of our box is coming through there. So all we need to do now is to follow a very similar procedure so that we can glue our bellows to the bottom of our box. Now I will do this on camera because it's very slightly different from uh, the approach that we've taken with these bellows sections to date. So let me just get some glue on and then I can explain. So what, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm getting a, a reasonable coverage of glue onto this the bottom of this bellows section but I'm keeping this area free from glue. The reason for that is that we've virtually sealed the top of our bellows so that when we apply pressure to push the bellows back inside the box 
the air needs to have somewhere to go. And by leaving these areas free of glue, it provides a passage for that air. So your bellows internally are not going to come under any sort of pressure and um, you know blow the sides out of them. So um, we don't need these bellows sections to actually act as bellows. You know, we're looking for them to pro provide springiness to our jack. So I've just applied the glue and now I'm just going to line this up over our container box so that there's an even spacing around the edge. And I'm just going to try and lower that onto the base with that even positioning. It doesn't have to be exact. This top collar easily fits within this box. So we do know that, that we're going to be fine there. So at this stage, what I tend to do is I'll hold that down for a little while just to give, to, to make sure that there is pressure running quite um, heavily onto those glued sections. Then once I'm sure it's gone off a bit, I will, I'll bring the lid down and just leave it because we know that the bellows is taller than the lid. So that just by having the lid in place, it's going to provide downward pressure to a, until that glue has gone off. So I'll do that. Obviously, I'm not going to wait whilst the camera is rolling. Um, once I'm happy that that bellows is nicely secured to the bottom of the box, I'll come back and we can have a look at that completed project. Right, so I'm happy enough now that our bellows has had long enough for that glue to go off from the bottom, so it should be nicely stuck to the bottom of our box. So now's the time to let him out. And there we go, one surprise jack in the box. And perhaps slightly more of a surprise than this little one here. The option that you go for perhaps is dependent upon the recipient of your gift and what you want to place as a gift within this box. So that completes this tutorial. The diagrams and information stills are coming up for you next, but don't forget there's also additional information for you in the description area for this video if that would be as, uh, of some use too. Additionally, if you're a golfing enthusiast, you might like to know that if all goes to plan, my next video tutorial should be a pill-shaped box that specifically has a golfing theme, so that might be of interest to you. Other than that, you know, as always, I do appreciate your time, so thank you very much for joining me and watching this video tutorial.